This is exactly what happens on the webinar. Coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri. It's the Faster Freedom Show. With your hosts, Sam Prim and Lucas Wall. We're talking about freedom. Hello and welcome to the Faster Freedom Show. My name is Sam. And I am not Lucas Walls. We got Matthew Sieb, Marty Dubs, Mr. Dubs, Steve and Marty Dow joining us today. That is all the nicknames of my cohort today. Quick story, last night we went to the Drake and J. Cole concert. Lucas bought out an entire suite box. We all went, we partied on his dime, and he stayed downtown and took the day off. So you are subbing in, Matthew. How are you doing today? I am subbing in. I am uh, feeling the effects from Drake. It was awesome. Um, I realized my age, though. And, um, yeah, it just... Uh, my bedtime's way too too early to be out that late, but it was a blast. Moving a little slow today, huh? A little slow, but we're ready to rock. I like it. We got a great episode today. A lot of fun stuff we're going to get into. If you're joining us live, whatever platform you're on, let us know where you're from. Comment in the comment section. If you're watching this on YouTube or on the podcast platforms, we record this live every Wednesday and Friday from 1.30 to 3 o'clock Central, so you can tune in on all social media platforms, including YouTube. Or if you're busy at this time, we understand you can watch and listen to the recording. So today, what we are going to go over, should I use the, should I do this now or are you going to click this, T? I got you. Okay. So we're, we're, the quick agenda for the episode, we're going to, going to go over today. We've got this little opening rant. We're going to chat, have fun, talk a lot about um, the Super Bowl. We're going to talk a little about Jeff Bezos. Then we're going to get into REI School, where we are going to talk about how to find deals. It's going to be a little bit of a um, opener for our guests today. Our live subject matter expert is Dennis Montgomery. He has bought, I would say, probably four to five hundred houses in his career. So he's our he's our he's our star acquisition rep. So he's going to talk about how to find deals. So if you're a new real estate investor and you want to find deals. He's the Patrick Mahomes, baby. He oh, there's that. Are you talking about? Yeah, we are going to talk about saying, goats a little bit. I'm just saying. Denny's the Patty Mahomes of the U.S. or of the St. Louis house buying um, place. All right, then we're going to do some live Q and A. So get your questions going. We're going to ask questions eventually. That'll be a live call in, but we're kind of working through the kinks of these first few episodes. So throw your questions in the chat box now and during that section. Then I'm going to riddle Matt. All right. Are you excited? <laughs> I I am excited. We're gonna. We're, we're going to see if I can uh, be stumped. Lucas always gets about one and a half right out That's of the three. Good. So we'll see what you do, see if you can disappoint him or not. And then we are going to do true and false where I try to get stumped. And then I haven't decided at the very end, we're going to shoot the um, outlines of the trash can if yours is going to count for Lucas or if I just get a practice shot. Uh, we're going to count it. Okay. We're going right. to count it. We're going to count it. I'm good with it. All right. So. The Super Bowl. Actually, before we get in the Super Bowl, let's talk a little bit more about uh, about Drake. So um, we went there, and I didn't know many of the songs, but I left. I was the first to leave at like 11, 15, 11, 20. When did you leave? Uh, probably 11, 45, and um, definitely they were still still moving in the right direction. They probably had two, three, four songs to go. So it was, um, yeah, it was an early exit, but it, it worked out well with uh, getting out of there. Did you say bye to everybody, or did you do the Irish not. goodbye Irish, like I do? Irish goodbye. That's Irish what I did. goodbye. I did. I say goodbye to you, or did I just roll? I feel like there's a time and a place like where the Irish goodbye is just like it should be the norm. Like, Which is that you got a concert, you got people, you know, in the zone. I, you saw Lucas. You saw the way he was dancing last night. Do you want to go up to Lucas, interrupt him, and say, "Hey, thank you for you know the fun night." like ruins the vibe so. no yeah and i don't the reason i the reason i do an irish goodbye and this may be why everybody does let us know in the chat box if you do irish goodbyes or not the reason i do irish goodbyes marty is because i don't want to get convinced into staying i know if i go dab up walls and say see ya he'll say stay another song and then i'll stay another song or two so the only way to guarantee my exit and my time frame is for me just to peace out and not tell anybody i have done this for years i'm an expert <laughs> probably started in 0304 so i've been working yeah. on this for about 20 years and i'm one of the best irish good buyers you're going to meet that's awesome yeah um yeah and you saw the effects so like courtney your wife like she she went and, and talked to jen my wife and 
Uh, you were probably there for 20, 25 minutes, minutes after minutes I wanted to leave. Yes. Than you wanted to leave. Yeah. So I think the Irish goodbye is the play. You just gotta, you gotta make sure all parties are on board. So if you're riding with someone, you need to, to make sure that they got the Irish goodbye game going. They do. Yeah. My, my, t- uh, my 10 30 time was not met. I ended up saying longer than I wanted, but that's okay. And if it's you're wondering, Drake didn't start till 10 30. Did we even tell everybody who you are? No. I said all your, so this is, his name is Matt Sieb. He has a lot of nicknames. He is, he is my right-hand man in Faster Freedom, the education company. He is the COO. He runs the entire show for Faster Freedom, um, the social media brand, the the um, education course, the, the mentorship, the community. He runs it all, and he just basically takes my crazy ideas and picks one or two of them and makes them work. Would you say that is a good description of your job? Yeah, I like to, to tell people that we're, we're on this locomotive, and uh, coal just gets, you know, kept keeps getting shoveled into this train and it's getting faster and faster and what i do here is is keep the train on the tracks or at least try my best uh in the process so you know we continue to move in the right direction goal is to inspire people to think differently about freedom we do a lot of cool things in a lot of different ways so just keeping the train on the tracks and uh yeah keeping you in check from time to time what do i do to the train i shove coal in it and and i derail do i like try to derail it and do i like change tracks and movements and ups and downs Uh, no, it's just, uh, you know, you have a lot of great ideas, which I love. <laughs> I love it. But, uh, yeah, it's just uh, doing the most strategically sound uh, method for, you know, growth. And obviously the goal is to get, you know, thousands of thousands, upon, uh, thousands of students, you know, on this new uh, path to freedom. So we just got to do it uh, effectively to make sure we – impact the most lives so i like it and last last thing before we get on to the um super bowl and a kind of our opening rant on that chest uh chest is flowing today huh <laughs> if we can zoom in on that great if not no big deal but marty's just I, are you wearing an undershirt i am not no we're, that's we're, an aggressive move for a th- for a wednesday you know what it's the same i'm gonna blame it on the st louis weather we got ups and downs it's like 65 outside it's golf weather i i committed to this before knowing that you know i could be swinging a golf club right now but um, you know, you wear, which is usually what you do on Friday. <laughs> exactly. But you know, you wear flannel, you need to, to let stuff breathe. So you got to pop a button every now and then. There you go. It looks great. All right. So the Super Bowl was the most watched Super Bowl in history, which I don't think is super, super surprising. So a hundred and twenty three million people in the U.S. watched the Super Bowl which was up from 115 last year, which was the record. So beat the record by a good 8, 9 million people. So it's uh, the number one show on every network it's on when it's played throughout the season. And obviously it's the most watched event um, ever. It was the most watched event ever, every single year. So uh, what did you think of Super Bowl? Good, bad, different? How would you rank uh, her out of 10? You know what? It was awesome. The the, the football game, it was uh, it was interesting because it, it was a roller coaster too. Like it started off extremely slow. Um not a ton of excitement, but I mean, going into that second half and, and the overtime, the new rules, and did they know the rules? Did they not know the rules? Nobody knows. Um, but yeah, it, it just finished finished with a bang for sure. And then uh, I know our generation with Usher was a, a big draw. So what did you think about uh, the game and Usher's performance? I enjoyed the performance a lot, actually. He got a little bit of hate just because the audio, but... He's dancing and moving. That's kind of Usher's thing. I've I've seen his concerts before. I've never been live, but it's always a little audio is a little sketchy because he's dancing and moving. He could lip sync if you want, yeah. or he could just sit there and probably sing good without dancing. So I prefer the dance, the movement, all that with the uh, audio being a little sketchy. So I was fine with that. I love the outcome. It allowed me to be um, so basically I'm like Patrick Mahomes, but for betting because uh, <laughs> seven for seven was tied all together. So I ended up going seven for seven in the playoffs, betting against the spread. So a couple things. One, I actually didn't ever bet. I used to gamble a little bit. We got a. Um, I mean, you used a, to like run an operation. Slightly, I did. Used so. to, Luke's and I used to be bookies in college. That's true. But anyways, I used to. Uh, I used to do that and gamble a little bit. You gamble a little bit responsibly. Be, um, so basically, I'm like Patrick Mahomes. But in general, I um, I definitely. Uh, put it out there though so i didn't actually bet but i put it out on social media before each game and went seven for seven so that's impressive so what was the response like people that follow you they want you know sam prim's real estate knowledge journey but there's got to be some crossover there's a lot of gambling gurus out there and to hear it from a, a real estate guy like like, did you get people in the DMs like, hey, like, send me your Venmo. Like, I want to. <laughs> no, I, like, I got I, I got a couple people commenting because professional bettors are about 56%. They win about 56% of the time. They make a living on it. 
And I would probably be pretty positive that if I bet on another seven games or picked, I would lose all seven to get to that 50%. But, um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't wasn't quite as impactful as far as, I mean, you know, because it was in a story and they don't I – mean, I got a few DMs. But, in general, I'm proud of my 7 for 7. But why don't you give a, another 7 for 7 stat with uh, with uh, Patty that you told me earlier. Yeah. Then, we'll get on, then we'll get on to old uh, – Old Kelsey running into Reed. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, so I read a stat earlier, and I, I shared it with you, but um, they they took all the, the data and analytics from uh, fourth quarter playoff. So it has to be playoff, but fourth quarter playoff, you're losing by seven points or less and under a minute. And um, there are some impressive names on this list. So the, the goal is, did they convert and did they get the points needed to – uh, get the outcome they wanted, which is winning the game or going to overtime. So there was uh, Tom Brady on the list, Drew Brees on the list, uh, a couple other big names from the past. But we're looking at like 40 to 50% conversion rate. So for like the best. For the best of the best. Like, I mean, Tom Brady, like. They Five used, for 11, you they, said, I think, something yeah, like that. They used, I mean, he's the GOAT, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's a new GOAT in town. There's a new sheriff in town, and it's Patty Mahomes. Patty Mahomes has done it. Seven out of seven times. See the, the what we did there. We looped in my looped seven for it. seven on my betting. So yes, um, so he's a hundred percent. So meaning that's why you see uh, offenses play differently with a minute or two left with Patty Mahomes on the other side of the ball because he's going to score. So yeah. like, do you you act weird? You do things different to try to keep the ball from him? I mean, shit, they did it. Thirteen seconds left. A couple years ago, and he he still um, drove down the field for the needed field goal. So yeah, it's a uh, he's special, and I just enjoy special. So I like I didn't mind the Patriots. I love watching Lakers. Are I, I just like watching um, like high quality uh, perfection or you know greatness. I I like watching greatness. I appreciate it, and we're watching it with him. So y'all need yeah. to take that in for sure. Yeah, and and greatness looks different to me. Like. Obviously, you can be like an incredible special athlete, but like what I think Patrick Mahomes and some of the greats of the past, like Tom Brady, like what they do is they elevate the people around them. Like you look at the receiving core, like there's nothing special. There's no massive names. Like obviously, you have Travis Kelsey. He's a you know human target that gets you know 11 targets a game. But I mean, he just elevates the entire team. He uh, carries himself really well, and he he just makes sure that you know. His team comes first, and he takes ownership, which is super cool. The button, I just I'm waiting for it you to wait pop. For the next one to go. Yeah. Um, so, uh, speaking of the human target, Mr. Kelsey, he uh, he bumped into old. Uh, he caught he caught Reed off balance a little bit, and he caught he kind of blindsided him. Uh, you can see it there if you're watching um, on on uh, social media or YouTube. Yeah, he he bumped right into him and got right into his face. So an interesting interesting kind of interaction. They've been together for like ten years, I think, or something along those lines. So they're they're going to be fine. But what did you think? You think it was a big deal, no deal, little deal? Yeah, I think uh, I'm in the middle. I'm on the fence, and I'll take a couple like different stances. But um, you can't be wishy washy. I'm not take a be stance. Wishy- okay, so I loved it personally. Okay, there you go. So in the moment, obviously, a lot of like immediate reactions online. I had family members texting our you know group family chat, big you know Chiefs fans, and they're like, like I can't believe he did that. And uh, I I come at the situation from a you know an athletic background and it's like i love that passion like mm-hmm. i think it shows passion i think uh i think he has a remorse for it now but like all right we're talking super bowl you're losing um you know heat of the moment you got your girl in the stands taylor's up there watching hey, hey. <laughs> so i uh i liked it in the moment and i think uh i think it was a learning lesson the the impact i think is for like kids that are watching that like that's the tough thing in my opinion it's like oh yeah that's all right so you know on my peewee football team i'm gonna be the the biggest baddest 12 year old out here so that's where my concern lies well you were kind of a bully in the hockey game so i get (laughs) it um yeah i don't have an issue with it at all the only issue was with it my concern was it is an issue between them two and it's not they both kind of downplayed it afterwards um, Kelsey said that, you know, he wishes he didn't quite catch him off balance, but he's, he went over the top a little bit. He kind of regrets it. Reed said no big deal. He said I'd give it right back to him all the time. I know I saw a highlight when Kelsey threw his helmet down a couple weeks ago. Um, Reed, the the assistant, somebody went to go give Kelsey's helmet back. He's like, no, freaking take his helmet from him. He needs to settle down. So, anyways, uh, great relationship. I have no issue with it. They, they He just wants to win. And um, Reed said it, and I believe it. He wasn't saying, like, he doesn't do it out of, like, uh, I want the stats. He's like, I can help the team get me the ball to help the team. He really 
really does think that way. It's not just yeah. saying that. So I don't think it's a big deal at all. I kind of liked it. All right, well, let's get to Bezos real quick. So Bezos is moving from Washington to Miami, Miami, Florida, and that is going to save him six hundred million dollars a year in taxes. What do you think? Can he spend that six hundred million in in in, in uh, uh, Miami? I think I think you could find a couple ways to do that. That's welcome just, to my. Anybody know Will Will Smith? Tyler doesn't. Tyler Will Smith, welcome to Miami. He's got a song. He says, um, uh, "Welcome." To, I don't know what I, I was going to wrap it, but Dominican women with cinnamon tans. Ooh, <laughs> T. York didn't know that was coming. That's like a Lucas right there. That, I, I mean, I kind of taught Luke everything he knows about rapping, but um, just interesting. Every you know, the there's federal taxes and then there's state taxes. Certain states have no income tax or, or di- different types of taxes, and you know, like Texas and Florida are no income stat, uh, tax states because they make up for it with service taxes, or they just have the big enough economy that they don't have to. So, um, just interesting where you live does make a difference, and yeah. a lot of people move down to um, Puerto Rico or Grand Caymans or something like that to pay less taxes or no taxes so um very interesting but um seattle's a cool city been there but uh miami's a little bit cooler i think yeah what impact do you think that will have on you know the seattle market just um presence i don't know i mean it's just a guy moving i get he's i get he's jeff bezos but how often is he at his house honestly i know he's not on amazon's board anymore or whatever but he's on blue origin traveling doing this doing that you know out, out on his yacht all the time Honestly, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe the restaurants he frequents that he spends two hundred grand on on <laughs> right. a weekend or whatever. Maybe, but other than that, they'll be fine. There's a lot of money up in Seattle. You yeah. know, Starbucks, Microsoft, all that. So they'll they'll be fine. Yeah, they'll be fine without him. All right, not a bad opening segment. I'm going to give you a eight out of ten. I'll take it. Good start. I'll take it. Good start. C's get degrees. It's a B. Well, I know, but so you beat the beat. <laughs> yeah, All right. let's go. All right, here we go. So um, let's get into house buying. So one of the biggest issues as new real estate investors and experienced real estate investors is finding houses. You need to find distressed properties. None of this works if you don't find a distressed property at a discount. You need it at a discount if you want to wholesale it. You need it at a discount if you want to flip it and make money. You need it at a discount if you want to keep it as a rental. It all starts like the base, 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 base foundation is a distressed property even before the money because you can wholesale it if you find a deal get under contract and don't find money you can always sell that contract so the very very base level foundation we're talking ground zero is finding distressed property so what we're going to do matthews we're going to go through a few slides here and we're going to talk about how to find deals i even have my clicker this time so i'm going to control the board a little bit which is exciting i have a note pushed down for next slide to yours prepared. So let's talk about how to find deals. This is real estate investing school. This is a segment that we do every single, um, every single week on the podcast. So you need to find deals. That's the most important part. Now let's define what a deal is. So what is, what is a deal, Matthew? Um, there, there are, there are kind of two things that are potentially distressed in a deal. What are they? Yeah. So you got the actual physical property rights. You have, a. A hoarder house, an inherited house. Um, I mean, there's a lot of situations, and then you have the actual individual. So, um, again, maybe it's a, a family member that inherited uh, a parent's house. Maybe it's somebody that can't keep up with the upkeep, uh, elderly. So, a ton of uh, advantages or opportunities out there, um, and it's not a, you know, malicious or uh, aggressive nature of going and finding these things. In my opinion, it's uh, it's serving the community, it's serving the person. Um, obviously, it's a big you know, burden to bear, uh, to take on that responsibility. So, um, a lot of opportunity. Yep. There is there a lot of opportunity. So what that makes a deal. So Matt kind of alluded to it. So there's some distress situation, either the house is distressed. You like Matt said, hoarder house is an issue. It's outdated. Won't pass code. Won't pass occupancy. Won't even sell because a bank won't lend on it or, and, or the person is distressed. There's a financial distress. They are inheriting a house that they, from a parent that passed away or moved into assisted care facility and they can't make the mortgage payment on it, or they can't keep the upkeep. They don't want to pay insurance and taxes and all this stuff on something that they're not going to benefit from, especially if it hasn't been, you know, updated in years and years and years, which is a big part of the situation. So, or they're in financial distress, yeah. um, tax liens, uh, pre foreclosure, a lot of different reasons. So the number of distressed houses out there would blow your mind mind it's still a small percentage of the houses but people don't understand the 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 width of the real estate industry it's a huge 150 million dwellings in the united states so even if one percent of them are distressed which is probably higher than that that's 1.5 million houses so it is a huge number 
but it's still a small percentage. So you're not going to find these houses just, you know, like in every neighborhood, there's not 10 of these houses. These aren't, these houses aren't falling off of trees. Um, these houses are harder to come across. So that's what we're going to get about. And let us know some of your, uh, your favorite lead sources in the chat box as we get through this. I see Tiki's on here. Let's go Tiki. Puerto Rico is the, the tax play for sure. There you go. All right. So um, networking. So let's talk about the two places to find deals. So we know the deal is a distressed property that won't pass code or occupancy or won't sell for maximum that they need to get out of. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of hit kick off the first one. You can do the second one. So I think personally, Matthew, and if anybody noticed, I've probably called you four or five different names so far. So i um, Steve, what I tell people <laughs> is if you're looking to buy 10 houses or less, I would stick with this first slide. We're going to show you some some the second slide, but I wouldn't spend a dollar on marketing. If you want to buy 10 houses or less, your time needs to be spread, spent analyzing deals. Your time needs to be spent developing relationships and stop spending money because it's, it's, it's really hard at the beginning to find a property, negotiate with the seller, meet the seller at the house. There usually is some type of... Um, emotional situation going on. You have to deal with that. You have to find the right um, numbers. You have to analyze the deal. You have to lock it under contract the right way. You have to like, you have to do so many things, just find the people that do all that. And they bring you the deal on yeah. a silver platter. So a uh, wholesalers is the number one place. You find wholesalers at local meetups, um, local Facebook groups, little band signs on the side of the road, Google them, local wholesalers, wholesalers go out, they find the distressed property, they get it bought super, super deep, they mark it up a little bit, and then they try to sell it to you and you have to do your own due diligence, but they're a great source. They do all the hard work for you. You pay for it when you buy it with their upcharge, but other than that, it's free to you. And um, what about the yeah. real estate agents? Yeah, so real estate agents, kind of in the same breath, but um, yeah, talk about market experts, right? Like you have somebody that knows the market, knows every zip code in your location, uh, they have clients that bring houses to them that aren't ready for the MLS. Mm -hmm. um, again, distress situation, needs a ton of upkeep. They don't want to do the work. They don't want to invest the money uh, to get it to you know MLS ready. So uh, building relationships with real estate agents uh, and specifically ones that are uh, investor friendly, cultivate that relationship and, and you'll have deals come to you. And it's another set of eyes like again like hey you know this is what i'm seeing this is what you can do if you're committed to you know doing the rehab and putting the money in it's a incredible source but it all starts with the relationship yeah for sure um and let us know where you're from i see TikTok up there i see instagram facebook uh, youtube let us know where you're from in the chat box we can see you by the way there's a screen outside of the shot that shows what's on the slide and it shows um your notes so i can see your comments as we get rolling so keep those in there so great Great points. And Matthew, it's similar to wholesalers, but a little bit different with agents. The cool thing is they bring you in usually. They don't necessarily always have a price like wholesalers do. They're saying it's worth this, it needs this, and you have to confirm everything. And they're probably a little bit over the top on what they're assuming. But agents usually will just bring you in on the deal and be an option. Like the agent's like, I can list it for this, or here's your cash offer, assuming it's that distress situation. But like, I used to buy houses for us. You know, I was one of the, the buyers when we first got started. And every single time the agent's like, hey, this is Sam, you know, works for a great company, super reputable, they'll close, you can trust them. And that wall yeah. that you're going to get if you're going direct to seller is it, it, it shatters down. They completely trust you. They're like, oh my gosh, you're here to help. Thank you. And you have their trust right away. And the agent is acting on their behalf. So you're not going to let you, you know, pay for pennies on the dollar. Hopefully they you can offer something that makes sense. It's like, you know, you can listed and get this or get a little less and close in two weeks with my offer kind of thing. So that's a huge advance of agents is that that wall that's up there is completely down because this isn't people aren't selling you their 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 car. I mean, even though yeah. some people are attached to that, they're selling you what their house right. that they grew up in, that their parents gave them or that they just have some connection to most likely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and really quick on that, like you bring those, you know, you bring the value to the agent and you know, hey, why don't you list it on the back end for me? And it's like, it's a win-win-win because win, win, you're you're helping the person in the distress situation. You've created a new awesome relationship where, you know, they're winning and you're winning and then you have an awesome property that's a wealth, you know, creating asset. So add it, you know, to the list of just checking the win boxes. Checking the win box, win-win-win. Thank you, Steve. We'll get into your name, Steve, here in a minute. All right, and then lastly, um, uh, for this section is connectors and connectors are just people that are connected and have a sphere of influence um, insurance agents um, elder law attorneys just people that are around a lot of people because life happens and that's where you come into play if enough people that know people know that you're looking to buy real estate as confusing as that may be so you just one connection away from somebody that has a large sphere of influence if they hear 
the, you know, their daily conversations, their work, um, their social media, um, through a connection they hear that somebody's looking to sell a house as is a handyman you know, fixer upper kind of thing, they're going to call you because they know. So you just need to have like a, a handful of like people that insurance agents, a great example, yeah. insurance agent, like our boy, Micah here, you know, in his early sixties. Um, but he's been insurance agent for 35 years. He's got a huge network. He's got people that he was their insurance agent. They have kids. Now he's their kids insurance agent as well as theirs. He's just a large, um, you know, a large sphere of influence. And then when something happens that, you know, it's like, Oh, he hears about it through changing insurance or just hears about it, he comes to us and we can buy the property and, and help make everybody a win. So that is huge right there. Um, how to find wholesale deals in California. So um, not all houses are close to a million dollars. You can look real estate uh, rentals 21, 22. Love that. Um, not all houses are, are that. Um, you're finding distressed houses. We're not talking market ready houses. I've seen so many um, examples of people find three, four hundred thousand dollar houses in California. They are distressed. They're not market ready houses. So We'll get in and keep the questions coming. We'll get to them. All right. So marketing, Matthew, why don't you hit that first one? So if you don't want to wait to develop these relationships or you don't know anybody right off the bat, you can't take the bull by the horns and do some networking yourself. So I want you to take that first one. This yeah. is you spending money to get leads. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, driving for dollars, like talk about like advantageous for many reasons. So like one, you're out there actively pursuing properties that, you know, meet the criteria of what you're looking for, but you're also getting a better sense of the community. Like how many people know uh, the neighboring community or the next zip code that you know could be in your buy box, but you just don't know enough about it? So like getting out there, seeing what's around, seeing when the new Chick Fil A is getting put up, like those are all telltale signs that that area is going to be you know up and coming, or maybe it's something you want to stay away from. So just a ton of opportunities and. Um, yeah, I mean, drive for dollars. I thought you, you nailed. It. I don't have anything to add. The only thing I would add is, um, you know, we have a. a, a a partner in batch leads that will give you a free trial yeah. as well as give you free deal credit. So just, we have a, you can drive for dollars in person or virtually. So um, check the show notes. If it's not there, just DM me on Instagram. I'll shoot you a free trial to batch leads. Um, so that's driving around and you know, it's not super efficient, but it's super effective because yeah. you're in an area. I always tell people just, take a different way to work every day that takes an extra five or 10 minutes. And through the apps, you can, you know, figure out where you've already gone. So you're not like repeating, but you're, you'll find some properties that you're, you know, you want when you send out direct mail, which is the next one I'll talk on, or you spend out like a Facebook ad, like you don't know who sees it. Like you don't know if you're even going to want that house, but if you drove by it, and you saw that it was distressed and it's an area you want to buy, you know you want that house. So yeah. it's super effective, just not efficient because you actually have to drive. It's like a big game of Pac-Man and you're looking for that strawberry. <laughs> Perfect, exactly. Um, and then direct mail is something that is is the probably the most proven source to find deals out of any source you're gonna do. But it requires commitment. You yeah. have to set you have to we spend we send twenty five thousand pieces of mail every two weeks and we don't stop. Yeah. And some months is great ROI. Some months is crappy ROI, but we don't stop because we get just as many calls on the third or fourth letter as we do the first letter. So you have to consistently do it. It's going to cost you thousands of dollars a month. They're the the big man's here. He's going to hop on here in a second. Um, we called you the Patty Mahomes of St. Louis wholesalers. So it's a big, big, um, a big shoes to fill, and you, you're you're handsome. So we'll get you on here in a couple minutes while we're finishing up. You can give us notes on this, Dennis. So, um, and then you can use bandit signs. Those are the signs you put on the side of the road that are you know two foot by three foot. Um, you see those little signs. You're gonna see a ton of political ones coming up this year. Um, Batch leads. I talked a little about them earlier. They're one of our partners that can help you in there. There are like endless ways to pay money to find deals. But again, like I said earlier, if you don't have negotiation skills, you don't want to be in these homes negotiating with these people, dealing with you know whatever going on with them, um, I would stick to, to, to the number one one, which is just networking. So yeah. what makes a good deal is um, making sure there's equity. Whether you're going to wholesale it, flip it, or rent it, you want to make sure there's equity, which means you want to make sure you're buying it at a deep enough discount. So the max allowable offer formula is what you're going to want to use. We're not going to go into a ton of detail here. I want to just introduce you to the formula and show you a, a quick example. But um, the a uh, you know the ARV times 75% minus repairs is the formula, and ARV stands for after repair value. So you have to look at what the house is going to be worth once it's fixed up. There's some art to it. There's some science to it. It's not like super complicated, but if me, you, and our esteemed guest DJ all look at a house, we're all going to come up with kind of different ARVs. So be conservative there. 75% just builds you in a 25% profit margin. Then you might got to subtract out your repairs, which is all your holding costs and owning costs and costs of money and everything. So let's look at a quick example. So the example is, um, say you, you get a house sent to you, Matthew, from a wholesaler. 
and you run some comps and it's a three bed, two bath, 2000 square foot house. And you look around and three or four of them have sold recently for around 250, 260. So put in 250, be conservative. Yep. Time 75%, which I think is like 187.5. And then it needs 40 grand worth of work, but put 10 grand in there for fluff and like hard money or private money costs. So that's your example. So that that house that a wholesaler brings you, don't pay more than 137,500. If you pay less, great. If you pay more, you're kind of running a little bit potential of a skinny deal. So that's a simple formula that you're gonna have to use over and over again, but that's, that's a pretty quick example. Yeah, and you, uh as far as like using the formula, obviously as time goes on and you get more confident with the, the zip code and location, like you can make, you know, more calculated risks based on what you're seeing in an area. But yeah, it's a great, great starting point. For sure. Yeah. And, and if it's like you're super conservative on your numbers and it's probably a 260, 270 house and probably could get it done for 40, all for this. And then if they say if they're at like 150 and you come to terms at 143 or something, you still should be okay. So just be conservative, have flexibility. How bad do you want the deal? And that kind of stuff and how efficient can you be? You just got to have some discipline with it and not let emotion get too involved yeah. like you do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm even keel, baby. If, if Dennis comes in, when Dennis comes in, are you going to drop her a button or are you going to keep him, keep it high and tight? Uh, we'll have to see what Dennis he's got. Wants. He's got a flow and no <laughs> undershirt. That's a aggressive move. Yeah, it's warm. Dennis has another shirt on. Okay. All right. So, um, so common mistakes, we kind of talked a little bit earlier. These are the only two ones that I super see super often is not sticking to your numbers. It's a 250 house. Don't think it's a 280 house because this one sold a year ago that you think you're going to do granted and make it incredible. No, stick to your numbers. Don't fudge. If you fudge the ARV or the repairs and don't add everything in there, it could, it could go south very, very quickly. If it's you know 250, but you think it's worth, you say it's worth 270, and it needs you know 50, but you think it, you say it needs 35 to make it work. That's those both of those on each side of it's going to make it a pretty tough uh, to make it a profitable deal. So that is that, and uh, and then common mistakes. The other one is giving up. A lot yeah. of people just give up, and you know, I it took me 30 different deals to get my first one. Jonathan Melke, I talk about all the time, took him six months inside of our community to get his first deal. So. Um, you know, not giving up is uh, the worst thing you can do. It's the only way you really fail. Yeah. And going back to Jonathan, like looking at, you know, point number one up there, um, being consistent, taking the emotion out of it and not, uh, not rushing anything because there's so much opportunity out there. Like, I feel like you're going to be in a, an incredibly worse situation versus not having a property versus getting one in three months down the road. You're like, Oh crap, I, I'm going to lose a 30 K or something, something bad's going to go, um, down and, and you've like, you forced yourself into that. So don't force it. Don't force it. Don't force it. Be forced less. All right. Okay. Awesome. Well, um, throw your favorite lead source in the chat box. If you have not, let's get on our desk Everybody, or get on our guests. Everybody do a, a golf clap for Dennis DJ Montgomery. Come sit down. You handsome devil. That's your chair. That's your microphone. Keep the microphone about six inches away from your mouth. Um, we always do a six inch joke like this is six inches for Courtney thinks this is six inches, but um, in general, keep it a couple of fists away. You should be good. Put on your headphones All so right. you can hear yourself. How are you doing, Dennis? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. So we introduced you a little bit earlier. We'll do it again. We'll let the, the cameras get set up. Stall for here a second. So Dennis, I said you have probably bought wholesaled 400 to 500 houses in, uh, in your career. Is that about right? Or is it more than that even you think? I think it's probably more than that. How much do you think it is? Uh, 50 a year for seven years. So that's 350. Yeah. So four to 500 was, I think, a good, a good, a good Hungry, guess. I'm, I'm good at math. You're Hungry good at and math. humble. Hungry <laughs> and humble. No, that the, Dennis doesn't do the max level offer. We just say, go buy it, and he does it. No, just kidding. So um, Dennis has been a wholesaler for uh, seven or eight years now. He has done you know the networking side and he's built his network we've given him paid marketing leads he's gone so you're going to be able to touch on on both sides of it so what we're going to do today dj is we're just going to try to give advice to newer investors that want to go find deals and want to um, turn up their deal flow so why don't you talk a little bit about um kind of how you got into real estate and your background of how you started to get a ton of deal flow your way because you buy more networking houses than anybody yeah so um well, I had to find a way to buy houses. So um, you talking about where I started? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, so you're kind of a little background in your real estate journey. Yeah, so I uh, started in real estate because I was doing rehabs and repairs on houses. So um, I saw that everybody I was doing work for was making all the money and I was doing all the work. How much were you getting paid per hour to do that? Uh, when I quit doing it, I was charging $40 an hour. That's not bad. No. Nice. It, was, uh, it wasn't bad. It was just if you weren't working, you weren't making money. Yep. 
So uh, it was way better than my hourly. Uh, I quit my hourly job to go do that. And okay. I quit that to start real estate. So I actually met a guy from here um, at a house and I said, what the heck is this wholesaling thing that all these investors are at? And he explained it to me and then I hired him to be my coach. And uh, CB. Yeah. Corey Boyles does all our fo uh, photos now. So mm. shout out Corey Boyle. So what do you say a quick left as we get going? Cause, um, what do you say to people that say, um, you know, wholesalers or real estate investors are, are hurting the housing market? What, what's your answer to that when people say that? Because I get that all the time. I know my answer. I'm interested in what your answer is. I think it's the exact opposite because I can show you dozens of houses where we've sold the highest price on the street after we rehab the house. Somebody has to buy them. Somebody has to fix them. If you sell a house that needs $30,000 repairs to a homeowner on the exterior of the house, that house is going to continue to look like crap because no homeowner is going to put that $30,000 in. Well, I, that's, that's exactly what I say. So I tell people there are, it's a small percentage of houses, but it's a big number of these distressed houses that if a wholesaler or a real estate investor doesn't buy, it's just going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And then all the other houses around it, our value is going to go down and homeowners, a lot of them, struggle to for a 20% down payment, right? They don't have 50 grand, they don't have the money to rehab it. They don't have the knowledge to rehab it. They don't have the connections, they don't have the experience because a bank's not going to fund a fixer upper, right? That's why you have hard money, and private money. So we are at real estate investors are literally adding houses to the needed supply and ha making every house in the area. It's just a lack of information is my opinion with people that don't they think it's like bad. It's literally a service that's needed. Yeah, um, there's actually some municipalities around here that made it uh, rules, uh, occupancy inspections, and people complained about them. Um, but wholesalers are the ones that came in, bought the houses, and sold them to the landlords that are looking for those houses. Those landlords brought up the values because everybody wanted those houses. And so those houses were looking nicer. All the values in the whole neighborhood are back up. And then uh, they removed those laws for the re rentals, the mm -hmm. rental laws, because all of a sudden the neighborhood was nice enough to where they didn't need those rental laws in place. So it proved that was just a proof of concept. Perfect. All right, M Matthew, what you got for him? Uh, how do you overcome objection? I love it. Uh, you see a lot of it. Yeah. And it's probably different every day, right? I, I don't get emotional about it. Um, that's the biggest one. So uh, I got cussed out actually for the first time in uh, uh, first time ever in, in a couple of years. Well, no, first time they in a couple don't years. Matt gets nervous when people cuss on the podcast. <laughs> he doesn't uh, like it for the you, brand. You can let it rip one time. I'm gonna leave the words that she said to me out. But uh, I was at a house and the lady didn't like my number, even though we already went over the numbers on the phone. She agreed with my rehab numbers. She agreed with the value of the house. Actually, her value was lower than mine. Um, but when I went to give her that uh, that offer, she decided to uh, drop some f bombs and run me out. So um, we were standing in the front front of the house on the front yard, and I was able to calm her down just by going back to what her purpose was of calling me in the first place. I mean, we've already talked about where our numbers are going to be and how we come up with our numbers. That seventy five percent of ARV minus cost of repairs. Um, so you take the facts back to the person whenever they have op, uh, objections with you. I mean, if you are uh, talking to somebody that has to sell their house because her son got shot across the street, that was the reason why she needed to sell the house. Uh, she was no longer wanting to be in the neighborhood. So I was like, Understandable. Well, yeah, so you're leaving, you're gonna sell. Your house needs a full rehab, you know that. Who are you gonna sell it to if you don't sell it to me or somebody like me? Yeah. Did you end up buying that? I don't know uh, yet. Not yet. Okay. So, so doors open. I doors like open. Um, so it's not a no, even though she cussed me out. That's all right. That's all right. I cuss you out sometimes. We've been there. Um, so no, that's. I think that's important to to note is when you're dealing with um, these, you know, homeowners. So this is if we're going direct to direct to seller marketing and dealing directly with the homeowner or a real estate agent, probably. Um, talk a little bit about because Dennis, something that I know that you do that not not everybody does, and I think it's a good thing, is you show them the numbers. You're not yeah. hiding behind anything. You show them the max liable offer formula. Prop, you know, most of these people are okay with us making a little bit of profit. And of course, right. you can fluff this or that and make it, but make it close. So talk about how you go over the numbers and you just you, you lay it all out there for me. Like, here's where I'm at. Here's how I got to this number. What do you think, right? Yeah. So I like a couple of different things with that. Um, I like asking the person. A lot of people don't want to know the number that they're asking. 
um, you can take advice from whoever, but uh, I like asking where you want to be at. Uh, that's just giving me a mindset of where you're at. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't affect what my offer is going to be. It's just seeing where you're at up front, so I can be up front with you, um, like you're way out of way out from where I need to be. Uh, I don't want to waste your time. You don't want to waste mine. Um, so, uh, kind of forgot which direction I was going with that. You're but, good. Um, you show them the numbers and you explain to them, yeah, hey, so, your house, do you, do you say like, hey, what do you think your house is worth? Do you, and do you help right. them plug into the formula? So I go to them with the, um, ask them the, the numbers up front. Then I go over where I need to be after talking to them about all their other issues, uh, situations, whatever it is. Um, this is the last part of being in the house is that number talk. Um, I, I used to sit down with a piece of paper and write out the uh, rehab in front of them. You don't do that anymore? Uh, I did it uh, a couple weeks ago, actually, mm -hmm. uh, with a lady. Actually, last week, I bought a house, uh, Thoroughbred. Um, uh, that was one that I went over the numbers with her. Um, and if you sit down and you write down a number, if I ask you how much it costs to replace your kitchen, you're not going to say $13,000. It's going to cost us thirteen to sixteen thousand dollars to put a brand new kitchen in. Um, so most of the time, people will say like twenty five, thirty. Every once in a while, you have somebody that says five thousand dollars, and you just call them out on it. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go down the numbers, if you ask them, uh, have you heard of what the house they're selling in your neighborhood for? Or hey, did you see that house down the street that sold for fifty nine thousand dollars? It's like if you point out those things and then ask them their information you can get on the same page with numbers a lot easier because you can't argue it uh, or they can't argue the facts. Well, I feel like so. you're building trust with them as well. You're like, they're like, it's 20 grand to do this kitchen. You're like, actually, no, it's more like 15 grand. They're like, yeah. oh, well, he's being honest. He's not just trying to screw me over and maximize every part of it. And that way you can call them out on something that they, you know, that they are potentially off on a little bit because you built that trust with them. Right. That's yeah. part of the genius of it, I think. And I also like 80% over the 75%, okay. not running my numbers at it, but using 80% instead of 75%, which um, if I go into a house and there's three comps, one sold at 300, one sold at 325, and one sold at 350, and they're all the same houses, I know that we can get to that 350 mark, but I'm going to run my numbers at that 325 mark mm -hmm. uh, because it's the it's an average or conservative number. Um, so at that point, I can say we're at 80% minus the cost of repairs because it's going to make up that difference, um, if that makes any sense. You know, and that's what so, when we walk through, that's what I say, be conservative on the front end. If you think it could potentially be worth this, it's not a guarantee. The market could shift a little bit, so just go with a little bit less, which is exactly yeah. what you said. If it might be 350 there's no guarantee, so go 333 three, whatever it is, and then on your rehab budget, you know, you just got to add a little bit because we're taking the risk of taking the house down, and none of it is unknown. It's yeah. not a math problem. There's art, there's science, and there as well. Right, and I, I, I'll, I'll straight up ask, like, um, do you want me to make a profit here? Like, because if you, if they're a dick and they don't want you to make any profit at all, sorry, dude. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see, it's different when you're on stage, yeah. Matthew. Where there's there's not going to be anything we could do to help you. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you're asking us for our services. You pay people for their services, and that's where our, we're going to be. I tell everybody, if we make 8 to 10% return on our investment, we're doing a great job. And so if we buy anywhere further than 80% or 75% is where we're really at, um, we take the risk of not even making 8% return on our money. And I can also show multiple examples of last year where I took major losses on houses that we bought as is. And there was one that we took a 50, 50 grand loss because the basement was buckled and we didn't know about it because it was finished when we bought it. Mm -hmm. So um, those there's are risks. risks. There's risks. So being able to explain those. Yeah. Um, Dennis, like what I'm hearing here is one communication, but like on top of communication, it's transparency. Like yeah. you're real, you're authentic, you're helping people with situations, but you also support it with data, which is super cool. Uh, obviously like in your uh, example, there was distress, there was, yep. you know, a lost family member. How many of these uh, situations where you leave without a contract, like how many follow-ups? Like I, I would think a lot of people sleep on the situation and realize, you know what, that is the best situation for me uh, yeah. right now. You got to leave it with them, even if it's not um, not a deal at that time. You got to leave it with them as in, I look forward to working with you. Um, so it's not a, even though you said no, I still look forward to helping you out in any way we can. Um, and then you're following up with them. Uh, our CRM tells us to follow up the next day. 
depending on the situation, I'll follow up most 95% of the time the following day or even later on that afternoon um, with the text messages thanking them for letting me come into their house. Um, but the ones that are like cold or they ran me off like that lady that cussed me out, I'm not calling her the next day. And give her a little time to breathe. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> give her a little bit of time. Let her, sure. let her talk to another investor that I know for a fact that there's not another investor that came into that house because she was impossible to get a hold of. And then she was 40 minutes late for my appointment that she scheduled at five o'clock at night, by the way, that's five forty, and I get home at five o'clock most nights. So that sucked. But, um, you know, and you got yelled at, you got yelled at, <laughs> but you leave it with them. I look forward to helping you out, you mm-hmm. know, she cuss you out. So I think it's the biggest thing is providing solutions. Cause I remember that when I was, you know, doing some acquisitions and I learned pretty quickly, probably from people like you that, I've been in houses and seen people be like, oh, look at that. That's a crack in, in, in the drywall. There must be something going on in the basement a little bit. And, oh, yeah, those cabinets, that got to be ripped out. Like, they know that the house isn't in good shape. You need right. to connect with them. I did. I'm sure you, I don't even talk about the house. I don't, I don't ever talk about the You house. just talk about the person. You, you figure out the solution. And I ended up, and you probably do too, getting house buys where you're not always the top bid. Yeah. It's because you're figuring out, hey, do you want to live here for two weeks after we'll get a you know a, a paperwork sign and closing and you can live here for two weeks and then you have to be out? Or do you want to come back after you rehab it because it right. was your childhood yeah. house? What do, you, what do you really want? I'm going to give you the best offer I can. Uh, we're going to you know make, yeah. uh, make a little bit of profit, nothing crazy because – if you show them that eight to ten percent, like the people are okay with that. They just yeah. if they don't know the numbers, they're assuming that you're screwing them and you're making fifty percent on your money, and that's yeah. never the case. And honestly, that's why I started showing the numbers because when I started doing this, um, I started on the dispo side, or I started on my own where I was just mm-hmm. joint venturing. Um, I was finding the deals and finding the buyers at the same time, um, so I wasn't taking anything down. The the struggle there was uh, when I switched was the fact that I was just giving these people an offer that I feel like when they got mad that I, they thought I was ripping them off mm-hmm. and that's not the person I want to be. So if you connect with the person and my favorite thing is to get the person talking. I love when Sarah, or Tammy, our, our ladies that answer the phone say that this person won't talk or this person was, you know, rude or whatever, because when you get in the house, find something to connect with them on uh, whatever it is on the, Walls. Do you ever make up something to connect with them on? Oh, absolutely. Okay, I will. I will 100% do that. But um, you, you know, you just absolutely don't make a lie that they can find out. Hey, there you go. <laughs> don't don't say don't you don't you're pretend Jewish. like you're a big cricket. Yeah, yeah. don't tell them you're Jewish when you're not, Dennis. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a good one that we've been through before with you. Yes, but uh, uh. <laughs> It truly happened, but um, you know, you find a way to connect. You point out the, the 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 their their reasonings for calling you, um, and then you go over the numbers with them. There's not a whole lot that can go wrong. If you're going to be able to buy the house, you'll be able to buy the house as long as you're connected. You explain everything to them. What else is there? Yeah. Uh, so it just just kind of a. Is it the right time? Are they ready? Are they going to call somebody else? What is? But most of the time, the houses you walk into, I would assume, they eventually sell. Probably most likely to investor. May, might they not, might not be ready now because they're pissed at all the offers they're getting. But within six months or a year, it's gonna sell. Yeah. Um, we just gotta stay top of mind and you know hope that there's not somebody that's gonna come way over. But a lot of the times, you probably buy houses that you're that big, the highest bid, but probably not always. What percentage of houses would you say you offer the highest offer for their house? Then you get it versus less. So I would say it's about probably 10% that we don't offer the highest and okay. we still get it. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, most people are most concerned about um, the highest number. And a lot of the companies that we go up against have the same uh, solutions as we do. Uh, we're going to close. There's not going to be any contingencies. You know, we're to put down a bunch of earnest money. If we're going against the bigger companies in St. Louis, those aren't things that we can really use against mm-hmm. them. So it has to be that highest number. That's where it comes down to. But when we're the company, like I bought a house because they saw us on, um, uh, they saw us on a commercial, and uh, they thought it was it gave us um, credibility. Know, credibility. That's the word. I was they saw about. Louis on a commercial. They, they said it was me. And I. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah I mean, you guys, this Lucas is a lie that balls. I did. I never say no. Uh, you're like, People yeah, I'm like, on TV. I'm TV, TV famous. You want my autograph? Yeah, exactly. I don't ever say. I never say I was the person on TV. I just never say I'm not. Lie of a mission, Dennis. Exactly. We'll talk about that later. 
Yeah, so so Dennis, you've been through this incredible journey uh, working with Faster House. So what's the most profitable deal with the company or on your own that you've come across and what's the story behind it? Like, how did you get the house? Let's not talk about the most profitable one. Let's talk about one that my management wanted to kill and I got in an argument with them and we ended up making a hundred grand on Matthew? it. Matthew? Yeah. Nice, so, let's talk about that. Not this Matthew, different Matthew. No, so we had a deal that there weren't any comparable rehabs. Uh, so the house was smaller than the houses that were sold around it. It's a really unique area where none of the houses are the same. Um, it's in a really hot, highly sought after area, but we're like, what is it worth? And so I put it under contract and uh, we tried to shop it to other people. Uh, we didn't want to do the rehab, which I wanted to do the rehab. I always want to do the rehab um, for the company. Um, and we couldn't get it sold. So um, the management was like, we're, we're losing money on this. We're just going to go ahead and take a 10 grand loss. And uh, we finally were able to convince them to uh, put it on the MLS. And we ended up selling over asking price and it was a $100,000 profit. Tells you that that tells you there's always usually a path of profitability if there you're patient. There's a path. Enough. You just have to. There's always a different exit strategy. So D Dennis said, "I'm dying on this hill today." Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. Drake said last yeah. night, "Which hill you want to die on?" No, was that Drake? That was Mike Kiko. That was Mike Kiko. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Which hill do you want to die on? Yesterday was a little bit of a blur. Um, so yeah, so it just goes to show that, and that's a great point you made. Having being able to dispo it is huge. So you're buying these properties, hope, most people listening probably want to you know own rentals to a certain degree at some point. But having those multiple ex exit strategies, shopping it in a Facebook group, listing it on the MLS gets in front of a ton of people, not yeah. just investors. Because I think whoever bought that right was buying it for their kid maybe and going to redo it with them or something along those lines. They lived down the street in a larger house and they wanted to stay in the same subdivision or neighborhood and they're buying it and they're just going to put the rehab into it. And... Mm -hmm. um, it appraised out because it was contingent upon appraisal. So it appraised out with the rehab that they were going to do to it. So nice. I mean, that's a good. So we turned a, a no deal to a 10K loss to a 100 grand profit. That's exactly does, what does that, that pay for your cruise? Uh, it paid for a couple of those vacations. I took. Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, Dennis. Yeah, Dennis is a, a, one of those guys that every month is on a week long vacation. That's not true. Just, Just the kidding. Winter. Just I don't kidding. leave during the summer. It's uh, too know. nice. Too nice here, and there's too much money to be made here. So um, what, you know, you're known, literally, you're known in the St. Louis area um, as one of the top wholesalers. You're with, you know, Fast Strauss, we're the right up there with anybody else as far as top home, home buying companies. No, as far we as are the top. Volume goes. No, we're the, uh, yeah, the best and also the top volume. I was trying to be, um, I was trying to not be cocky, but yes, we are the biggest <laughs> and the best in St. Louis. And hey. you're, you're the top guy. You're the top yes. of the food chain. What are you known for? Well, one... It is a, the biggest compliment is when I go into a house and somebody's like, oh, yeah, I was just here with Tom, and he said that you guys are a great company, or, mm. oh, Dennis, or, like, oh, Dennis is here. You know, we might as well not even come in. Like, those are the things. Because they know the big dog. Um, hoop, hoop, hoop. I, uh, that's what I like to do to make happen is uh, scare other people off. So Quick story time. Tell them about the big dog in Florida. Oh, it was terrible. So we're walking on the sidewalk. We were in, we were in Jacksonville yeah. at, a, at a mastermind a couple weeks ago. Jacksonville mastermind. We got there early. We had a bunch of time, and I don't know how we ended up with this idea, but we're like, hey, let's go get a haircut. So we walked to, to sports club. Dennis doesn't have that issue. Yeah. Never been in a barber chair. It's all ever. right. It's all right. So we're walking to the sport, sports club. Sam had too many Celsiuses that, that day, and uh, he started going, because I'm he a dog. barking like – as loud as he possibly could and this this poor lady pumping gas like was so startled she turned around and like i don't know what she thought of sam or, or myself she got no so. dogs in town <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what to do with you man i scared an old lady it was an accident sorry ma'am um i was just letting them know that that i was around so dennis we are the best of the best what but what are you known for like you are known for something and you're known for a certain source of deal flow so talk a little bit about your your favorite deal flow source because this is anybody can do it he's going to give you little insights but it's not even you can know exactly how dennis does it but you have to consistently do it and build up the reputation that you have so why don't you talk a little bit about that yeah and i don't think it's just the so i work with real estate agents okay that's that what is, i was getting that yes. is uh that's what he wanted me to say um that's true though but so my whole week is spent uh, reaching out to agents, sitting down and having coffees, um, just really networking with them, um, networking with brokerages uh, to get those agents to know who we are. 
Um, most agents aren't going to run across more than one deal a year, um, if that. And so it's really just spreading a wide net and staying in front of them. Um, this morning, right before I came, not even this morning, right before I came down here, I was just going through my phone and just texting agents that I've worked with in the past. And it's it builds. I have 400 and something agents in my phone that um, I couldn't tell you who they all are or even three quarters of them. But they're agents that I've worked with in the past that have sent me something. So I just continuously follow up and um, it produces houses. How many houses would you say you buy a year from real estate agents? I think last year we're in around the 35 mark. Just for you? Just for me. Yeah. So And that's me. Don't tell my boss this, but I am not nearly as uh, proactive as some people could be. So he's basically saying, <laughs> I have figured out a system that allows me to not have to grind 24-7 to still get a good deal flow. I think it's yeah. all right with that. So you've, no. you, you've been working at that. So 35 houses real quick. That's three houses a month with $0 in marketing spent. Now, he has spent time networking and working with in the past, coffees, lunches, all that stuff. Yeah. But that is, that's that gravy train we talked about. And I was telling uh, Matt earlier, when I used to kind of deal with agents, I remembered specifically, especially some agents I just got to know. They knew Fast Routes, they know the brand. But you walk in the door, and that guard between you and the seller is gone because right. the agent has a connection, and they, they say, hey, this is Dennis. Work with them before they work for a great company. Their clothes are going to give you a great fair offer. We can discuss we should list it or go with them, but they're going to close. And so yeah. that 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 barrier is gone, and that really allows you to connect with the seller on another level that maybe helps. So that's yeah. my favorite part because you don't get that with wholesalers. You have to build that yourself. Agents is the only really way that you completely get their their wall down right when you enter the door. It's really fun. Agents and attorneys. Yeah, attorneys uh, is another attorneys one. Attorneys yeah. is a huge one, um, but. Uh, I would say that the hardest part about it is getting agents to understand the numbers. Like I uh, looked at a house uh, yesterday and the agent said, I want them to sell for, I don't know why they want to sell to an investor because I want them to sell for the highest amount. Well, the agent's supposed to do what's best for the seller, not for themselves. Mm -hmm. And she's just worried about commission at that point. And she flat out said it in that statement. But um, uh, once the agent understands it, I literally have agents that call me and say, hey, I have this house. This is the number. I got a contract written up for you. Just come sign it. And I know that those, and they're usually, I mean, I don't know that there's been one time where I haven't, I've been in that situation and didn't sign the contract. Because if they, they do ask, everything for you. You just built the relationship. We call it the gravy train. It's if you can get, and, you know, we're speaking a little in generalities, but I think you both would agree. If you can, it's going to take you six months or a year, but if you can get five good wholesalers and five good agents bringing you constant deal flow that's a handful of houses a yeah. year for free now it's gonna you're gonna have to talk to 80 agents to get the or maybe 50 agents to get those five good ones that understand investing you're i gonna, would say it's probably a lot more than those 50 but 80 you i i think that so um uh matt is on our team another matt there's a lot of mats i know you freaking popular basic bitches <laughs> so, all right sorry go he he works with agents and uh i think that his his sphere that he works with is in the 200 and something range before he started buying yeah so so, so yeah so just a big number but yeah good yeah. points but it, it's going to take time and um, a lot time. of inefficiencies at first but you get five good agents, five good wholesalers, and agents that look for deals and wholesalers that bring you deals first. You're going to get yep. the first. You're going to be at the bottom of the chain with wholesalers. You have to work your way up for the good ones. And you'll um, be at the bottom of the chain for the real estate agents. Like, but once you work your way up, right. I mean, literally, I st I tell people if you want to buy ten houses or less a year, focus on networking. You can do it for sure. It may take a yeah. little time, but it's free, and you're going to develop these relationships. And I mean. I would assume you get, you know, obviously if you bought 35 houses from wholesalers last year, you got probably 150, 200 leads for, or sorry, 35 houses from agents last year, probably got 150, 200 leads and that's Easily. all for free. Yeah, I'm in one in 10, so yeah. when it comes to one in eight when it comes to closing. So um, I would say that uh, um, the biggest part with agents is teaching them, is mm -hmm. coaching them, because once they understand it, then that's where everything goes really smooth. They kind of almost work for you. They're little foot soldiers yeah, out there. They go out there and look for houses. And I have several that are sending me stuff every other day that they found that's not their deal, but at least they understand. The, and um, as far as you said, wholesalers, I passed up on a lot of deals. I am not a big fan of wholesalers, working with wholesalers, um, just because of, I'm not talking bad because I am a wholesaler. 
but um, I was they're cheap up. bastards. That's why. <laughs> or they send out fluff numbers. So they'll send out all oh, this house is worth three hundred thousand dollars, and the house next door fully rehab sold for two fifty. It's like no, um, but uh, I passed up on a lot of those last year. Those relationships and just picking up those relationships with just a couple of wholesalers. I already have leads that I was I was just skipping over, sending it to other guys, but they keep switching out. We keep rotating guys in and out, so. I'm going to stop doing that. Well, there you go. There you go. That's one way to look at it. Um, so, DJ, we have – notice I've called everybody multiple names, but you go by DJ and Dennis. I've called him about 20 different names. So um, <laughs> people listening, a majority of people listening are newer investors that have done little to no deals or none deals or no deals. So what advice would you give somebody that's like, I want to buy my first deal, wholesale, flip, rental, doesn't matter in 2024 what's are some like big action items or things you would tell them to go do to start to turn that flywheel because they're not going to go buy a house by the end of the day if they've never bought one before probably yeah um one get in the community of investors wherever you're at um we have the buyers club here community of real estate investors that's how i found this company that's how sam and lucas probably found this company mm -hmm. i mean um that's the biggest thing surround yourself with people um, I would say that if I was doing the wholesaling side only, and I wasn't trying to build a rental portfolio, I would find the buyer first and, um, go from there. Uh, the buyer is where you make your money. So find the buyer, find what they're looking for and get the deal done. What is that called? That is called joint venturing or reverse wholesaling. Reverse wholesaling. Yep. That both of those things. So they so. basically, yeah, you can get a good deal. If you can't sell it, doesn't really matter. But if you go find a buyer that's like, Hey, I'm looking at six, three, three Oh four, anything under 500 K I'll take down and have a private money lined up. Doesn't right. matter what it leads. You go spend marketing, looking there, connect network there. And that's just way you have a, a baked in buyer on the back end that Absolutely. could just get the momentum for you. Right. Yeah. You're not always going to be able to do that, but I, I agree. That's a good place to start. Yeah. And all these RIAs that are around, that's exactly where I found when I so I started when I stopped doing maintenance I started doing this on my own and I spent three hundred dollars a month in marketing because that's all I could afford so that's not going to produce that many letters so I was still doing um, three or four deals a month um, on my own and that wasn't coming from the letters I was sending out it was coming from finding wholesalers uh, at one meetup that had a house to sell and going to another meetup and finding the buyer and connecting the dots so um, as far as rentals and everything else man tough the first one is the hardest one after that just kind of snowballs so. how many rentals do you own now i i don't even know I, I um i know you bought a crap ton there for a while i don't know how much you've been adding we keep selling um so tennis well, hey well when they come vacant we got to rehab them and sell them <laughs> but we're going to start buying uh again this next month after we get a couple of these houses that are trashed uh rehabbed and sold so um but i think we're at 27 doors so. I know, pretty damn good. Um, I like it, Dennis. Uh, you missed it earlier. I did a little Will Smith rap because um, nice. because Jeff Bezos moving to Miami. Do you know that Miami song by Will Smith? I do. Dominican women with cinnamon tans. That's the only thing I can say, but it sounds good. <laughs> it's a great song. It especially is. Especially when you're in Miami, sitting on the beach. There you go. Yeah. I've, I've I don't know if I've ever been to Miami. Well, you need to go. It's probably a good thing. Overrated. Lucas is going in a couple months. He Let's is. Go with him, man. He is. No, I'm good. We spent enough time together. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, Dennis, um, anything you want to leave the people with? That was a great segment. I, I know people got some nuggets out of, you know, strategies or um, avenues to go down to find properties. Anything you want to leave people with? Just do it. I Ooh. Honestly, you just got to do it. It's scary. My first rental, I didn't have any extra money. Um, I mean, I, I was making good money, but uh, I didn't have extra money and uh didn't take out enough for the rehab didn't um didn't line up funding after the fact all those things line up i just got to do it so i was able to line up funding uh for long-term funding that's what i meant i mm -hmm. had short term but when i first bought it i literally found out somebody lend me the money and ran a rehab that was totally bad uh totally but off. you did it and but i did it and so um just get going and it, you will figure it out if you have to so i like it just do it nike just nike and tiger just broke up so they might be looking for a, a new a new spokesperson Dude, so you i can would be totally nike do that just for dj baby you know just for the free, free gear clothes you know you get some free clothes from us you probably didn't pay for that hoodie this hoodie is old this yeah. logo is that is our old logo. logo yeah that's uh right after you came in mm -hmm. 
Uh, so I designed that logo. The faces of Nike, MJ, and DJ. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. synergies are all over the place. Yeah, I think so. Make sure right. Awesome. Thanks for coming, man. I appreciate it yeah. very, very much. This uh, place looks awesome. Yeah, it's been fun to work in the crew, put a lot of work into it. Right on. All right. Off. Boom. Good. All right. Thank you, DJ. That was a fun segment. Thank you, man. You, you did a great job, as expected. Don't trip over any of the cords as uh, as they're getting the. I don't know if they got the cameras back set up or not. But uh, Matthew, we're getting ready to get in some live Q and A. So ask your questions on um, whatever platform you're on. They're going to pop up on the screen. Ask your questions as they're getting that all set up and as we're queuing up the questions. Matt, I thought I'd talk a little bit about. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this, right? So we have three million followers on social media. Yes, and we don't do it the way that most people do it. Most people on social media, they, you know, pay Grant Cardone 150 grand to come hang on their office to get some content shot with them. They do events, live events, and they pay people money to come and have everybody stare at them and grow their following that way. And we are kind of, we're in the middle of the country. I don't have a ton of friends in the space. We just do it our own way. And I kind of like that. We're like the, uh, like the people's, like the, the, we're what the is outlaw? Yeah. The, well, we're like the, the, uh, uh, open the Phoenix, the people's <laughs> open. Like <laughs> we're, people. we just do it. Like I don't, I haven't paid anybody money to connect or do anything. We just do it ourselves. And yeah, maybe we're not growing as fast and we're not in California. We're at 80 other influencers. There's no other really ones in St. Louis that to any, uh, huge degree. We just do it our own way and, and it might be a little bit slower going, but I like it. We're definitely different that we're not, I don't want to try to, I don't want to be too aggressive with this, but we don't like whore ourselves out for a following. We just put out good content and it works. So anyways, I'm still working through that and how we do that. But I think it's I think it's fun that we do it our own way. Yeah. And I think like being authentically you and uh, you look at, you know, people out in the marketplace doing some of those uh, strategies and things. um, Are they really living to that mission and like their focus or are they just doing it, you know, because uh, X, Y and Z started it and they're like, oh, yeah, it's a it's a hot trend. I'm going to jump on it. So like you're doing the long play game, which I love and love being a part of that. Awesome. Well, uh I like it too. I think it's fun as they were setting that up. I just, I'm going to work on articulating that a little bit better, but I just, um, and maybe it's smart to pay people to, I mean, to like pay for other people's influence, but I I've known and seen like if they come through organically cause they see you and they like you and they have the fourth video they've seen and they follow you, that's much better than, Hey, I was on a live with Grant Cardone cause I paid him and his followers follow me. They're really there for Grant. So awesome. I like it. So let's, let's have some questions pop up. Are we going to have them pop up or am I going to read them off the screen? So they're going to pop up. I'll read them off screen. Okay, perfect. All right. So um, I saw a, a, a question. Um, hey, Sam, shot by shot by JJ. Hey, Sam, I was curious. How many doors do I real, realistically need to tire, retire at 30? Wow. I read that really That's incorrect. a loaded question. Okay. Well, you go first then. Oh. He asked Sam, but I want Matt to go. Yeah. Marty. I mean, I mean loaded Martin. question. I mean, a lot of variables of like what living and what retirement looks like to you. I mean, we talk about it all the time with community members and their goals. Uh, Freedom could be freedom of time. Freedom could be freedom of money. Obviously, this is a financially, you know, charged question. But um, I just think that there's so many. It's a it's an open door question right there. And I'm going to pass it to you. And you're going to close the door. How about that? Um, Yeah, so in order to retire by 30, so there's a couple different ways to look at this. Number one, just the straight number. So your financial freedom number is you want $5,000 a month. Those are your active expenses. So you need to get enough rentals that bring in $5,000 a month net cash flow. So if you're able to buy rentals that net $500 a month because you manage them yourself or whatever, you need to buy 10 rental properties to get to $5,000 a month. So however many rental properties you need to buy to get to your, you know, that break even point as far as bringing in passive income that's going to pay for your expenses. And if it's 10,000, whatever it is, most people's numbers about 10,000. So yeah. you need to get, you know, if you're cash flowing again, that 500 bucks a month, you need to get 20 rental properties. Or if you're cash flowing less, you need to buy more rental properties. So that's the first way to look at it is just the financial freedom aspect of it however that's not the best way to do it I, luke's and i figured that out pretty quickly luke was i think making 65 70 grand um when we kind of started this at, at his job and our first goal was to get him out of his job and you know we're like how many we were cash like a sweet deal right there yeah well we're yeah well we're, we're cash flowing 250 bucks a door i don't even know the math but with like growing and scaling and using none of your own money and not really knowing what we were doing it would have taken us years to do that like several years so what we did about 18 months in we're like we can get 200 bucks a month cash flow and we're going to keep doing this, but let's just wholesale and flip. And it's active, but it allows us to quit our job 
and that's really what we wanted. That's the freedom that we wanted. I didn't. Most people don't want to, especially people with ambition, Matthew. Most people don't want to just quit their job. Yeah. They want to, or they, sorry, most people just don't want to quit working and be done. Um, I, I misspoke there. They just want to have control over their day and be their own boss and work a lot one week less. They just want to find that freedom. Um, and that's usually what it, what it boils down to. So for that, again, wholesaling and flipping as well as adding rentals is the best way to do that. I, we did it the wrong way at first, and it cost us a little bit of time, but not a ton. We, we stepped on the gas pretty quick when we figured it yeah. out. Yeah, and I feel like if the goal is like, hey, I want real estate to be the vehicle for retirement, um, like there's a, a passion to it. Like you want to be a part of it. You want to manage that. So you've established contractors, financial partners, crews to clean the houses. So like you're involved so much, like acquiring a house isn't a huge like burden in my opinion, because you have people taking charge on the rehab process and property management. So I, I think you'll always stay active to some degree. I agree. It's just like how much do you really want to do it? And then you made an awesome point. Like, Everybody thinks long-term rentals, 200 to 300 bucks uh, cash flow per door. Um, but there's so many ways to do it. There's the now money with wholesaling and fix and flip. So it's like you could literally recoup your salary through one or two fix and flips, which is insane. But obviously the long-term like generational wealth or wealth for a long time is, is through that rental. And like there's strategies within that to cash flow more like midterm rentals like we looked at that you know last week on that that webinar but we're not talking 200 300 bucks a door it's four or 700 crazy to a thousand bucks a door yeah yeah. so there's a ton of strategies and just having that mix and like knowing you like back into your goal basically yeah and that's why real estate investing is the only avenue if anybody wants to retire or create financial freedom or somewhat independence in the next, you know, handful of years because you can, you know, wholesale, fix and flip, you know, whole t- whole tail. Yeah. Ron LeGrand made that whole word tail. up. Um, and you can, you know, uh, do midterm rentals. You can do short-term rentals. You can um, arbitrage Airbnb. So there's so many different things you can do for active and passive income uh, through real estate. That's why it's, it's the best strategy. And if you didn't know, we're answering questions right now for the next eight minutes. Yeah. So throw whatever questions you have um, in the chat box. So yeah. Devin has an interesting one. Do you have something really else? Quick, yeah. Go, hey, I, do just, it. Just the, like, it's interesting because our community members, like they come in, they hear a lot about rentals and mm-hmm. rentals and rentals. Um, and the burr strategy but like i don't see the burr strategy as like hey you have to make it a rental like i see what we teach in our community and teach online you know for free on youtube and all that stuff it's it's a finding distressed property so like finding the opportunity and then you have exit strategies and within certain strategies you have alternative strategies like midterm and short term so it's just find the property and then figure it out based mm-hmm. on your goals it's it's cr- that simple i agree and dennis talked a little bit about reverse wholesaling which i think is good find that buyer first you can do that but i would look for a buyer in the house because you if you get a good deal the buyers will come yeah and worst case you have a contention in there if you can't find a buyer so i i would say do both so i like it all right mr devon do you uh if you could buy i can't read today you want me to read this one? can you do that i'm struggling yeah. to read maybe it's that uh that fourth or fifth vodka from last night yes still sitting there uh, if you could buy a house anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? That's a that's a fun one. What do you got for that one, Bubs? Oh, I'm just going off past experiences. Okay. And, uh, I'm going to go with Santorini. It's in Is Greece. that in Texas? Okay. Greece. Okay. So if we're going anywhere in the world. That was a joke. The, I know that wasn't in world, Texas. Greece. I mean, the, the fact that Rick Ross sings about Santorini a lot, I mean. I mean, if Rick volumes. Ross sings about it, yeah, yeah, for sure. So I would, I would base my where I move my family yeah. on Rick Ross for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, I, I love that answer. You know, see, I'm not, I'm not gonna pick a house of somewhere I've never been. So you're gonna pick Cancun? Um, no, I don't know where I really like. Uh, I, you know, a place I really like. Um, is I really like Scottsdale. I love the Scottsdale area. I really like that. I don't know. It gets hot a lot. Probably wouldn't go in California. I love Florida. So maybe somewhere yeah. there in 30A there. I, I, I don't want to live in another country. I'm so, I, I just don't. Um, and I know we're having fun with it, but like family and all that. So I don't want to be that far from my family. So I'm going to pick somewhere. I would say uh, Scottsdale or somewhere in Florida is where I, I'd move. And we could move. We talked about this earlier. The last episode with Kale, we talked about location versus environment. And I, I just want to be in the right environment. That's why I'm here in St. Louis. We could do this from Florida, and I could afford living in Florida, and I could almost do it remote maybe even, in. but I want to be around this. So it's about the environment. So if there could be one place I'd be, it'd probably be right here in freaking St. Louis, Missouri. That's very well said. I like that. 
environment. Grease Morgan's never, um, never been to Grease. We'll go to Grease Morgan. Um, was this his first reel? Uh, okay. How do you choose where to invest first? I love that. So how do you choose where to invest first? So this is a great one. So we're, I'm going to kind of, um, I'm going to kind of uh, steal this one and I'm going to like repeat the question. And so maybe we can make it into a short. What do you think about that? I think that's I what like t was saying, but I don't know for sure what he's saying there. So um, how do you choose where to invest? Well, I think it depends on what your long-term goals are. So if your goal is to create passive income through rental properties, you're probably going to need to pick the Midwest and the Southie. The numbers just work that way in the country. The country's moving there. The cost of living is good. The taxes are good. The laws are good. And you can buy properties that will grow in value and produce cash flow. If you buy a house in Boston, it's not going to produce cash flow, but it will grow in value. So if you want that passive wealth, Midwest and the Southeast. But if you want a wholesale or fix and flip, you can do that from California to Texas to Minnesota to Florida, New York. You can do that anywhere. So depending on what you want is where you should invest. So if you're looking for the long-term game, you know, Midwest, Southeast. And if you're looking for just quick money now, anywhere in the country works. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on like, so obviously you picked a market like Boston, like tough market to cash flow for a lot of reasons, but do you think like the introduction of like a midterm rental, like if there's opportunity in something like a midterm rental in one of those markets, like, and that fits your goal, like, do you see like the perception of some of these markets changing with opportunity? That's For sure. Like midterm, that's a great point. Like the midterm rentals up there in Boston, that's, you're going to be able, the reason I picked that is because I know people that invest there and they're like, I don't remember the exact numbers. I don't want to exaggerate, but I think they're like, we'd lose like $800 a month. And yeah. we love it because the property goes up in value with a debt pay down a thousand dollars. So they're like netting positively a couple hundred bucks a month when they factor in appreciation, you know, the debt pay down, all the tax benefits that go into real estate. So it's a net positive for them, even though they're losing money on paper. When you, if you invest 800 bucks in your IRA or 401k from your, from your paycheck every single month, that's the same, it's like the same way to right. kind of look at it. It's just an investment for the future. Right. So you're not getting cash flow away from that either. Yeah. So that's a good way to look at it. I like it. We got, we got nice. What's that flag? Do you know what that flag there is at the oh, bottom is? New Zealand. Is that New Zealand? Yeah, 100%. I, oh, no, 0% chance that's New Zealand. New Zealand. Um, thoughts about Airbnb in Vegas. You're a Vegas man. Uh, I enjoy Vegas. Was that where you would live? Oh, man. I don't know if I'd make it that long. You, I mean, yeah, you couldn't work f for me in Vegas. You'd That's be, true. Yeah, you're, uh, you got you got like just a slice of degenerate gambling in you, just a slice. Yeah, just there's so many just distractions and mm -hmm. things. So let's stay. You know what? I'm staying in my environment. There you go. I like it. So what do you think about Airbnbs in Vegas, though? Uh, I don't know the laws, so like that that would be my first like question. I would raise. They're allowed for sure. Okay, they're allowed. Uh, I think it's an awesome opportunity. Um. Again, everything comes back down to do the numbers make sense. Mm -hmm. So if the opportunity is there, it meets your goal, you have, you know, the vehicle, which is the property. Um, yeah, make it happen. Like, what are you waiting for? My only issue with Vegas Airbnbs there is it's, and I agree with you, but it's such a strip. It's all about the strip, right? So, like, yeah. I feel like people want to stay in the hotels, to gamble all night, to go to the the clubs, the shows, the strip, oh, strip clubs, everything they go to, and it's right there. As opposed to an Airbnb is gonna have to be off the strip, out of town, even if it's a ten minute Uber ride, it's fine. And and but I feel like most places there's like so many different attractions. You can pick an Airbnb in Tampa, and you you'll be on the bay for over here. You're gonna go over, like you, Airbnb doesn't really matter because there, you move around so much. There's, it's so centralized in Vegas. And I, I mean, I'm not even a Vegas expert. I've only been there probably five times, but it's so centralized of, of like the attractions that yeah. I think you'd want to be close to that. But I, I mean, I just was making a point. I don't so even know what that. about this? Like, okay. Remember we were in Vegas. I, I feel like there was an abundance of like kids on the strip. Yeah, it was and odd. It, it didn't make sense. I didn't love and, like, it. I would imagine that you'd be more comfortable. Like we all have kids that are young and it's like, if you, stay in a hotel or you stay in a house like dramatic difference in like the way you are able to parent able to provide meals and south africa stuff. i knew it wasn't oh, new zealand man. i was gonna say ernie south Af i was gonna say south africa i've seen it on ernie ells but that uh musk is south africa too i think yeah, yeah. all right so, keep going kyle's south africa too oh, yes so anyway i feel like there's probably a need maybe not the big as big of a need as i thought but there's probably a, a family there are more than it. i thought more than i thought too and quick story when matt and i went to vegas 
Um, we, we flew in. We were there to be on a couple of podcasts. We were on Sean Kelly's podcast, Pineda's podcast, a couple other ones out there for just kind of a, a little like getaway for us uh, and then as well as podcasts. And we got there the first night and tired, jet lag, traveling. It's a, you know, two times, two, two time zones over for us. And um, that first night I was ready for bed and we met up with a friend and it was Brandon. Uh, we met a friend Cam and Brandon uh, Turner with Bigger Pockets or formerly with Bigger Pockets. So we got to hang out with those guys that we don't ever really see and get to know a little bit. So we're like, all right, they invited us out. So we went to the little whiskey club with them. We went with a sommelier to a fancy dinner and it was like 11 or 12, <laughs> which is two o'clock yeah. my time. And I just, and we didn't party hard, drank a okay amount, nothing crazy. And then like went home and like, I got to bed at like 12 30, one o'clock, which is like three o'clock my time, which is insane. So the next two nights we were in bed by like eight 30, nine yeah, o'clock, literally ate dinner, sat there. We're like, should we do something? We're like, what about going to bed? <laughs> yeah, I like that idea, especially because it's 10 o'clock because of the time change. Oh, so yeah. um, if you're either got to be in Vegas for a few days, get used to the time change for us, or you just got to go hard and like do Adderall or whatever and stay up all night, which yeah. I wasn't doing. Yeah. Cool. All right. Awesome. So that was great. Um, all, uh, Airbnb is only allowed on North Resident side. There you go. I like it. Awesome. Well, that was our, our live Q&A section. That was a fun little one. So thank you for doing that. We uh, we have breaking news. Do we have breaking news? A several shot at Kansas City Super Bowl parade. Yikes. Oh, my gosh. That's not good. Not good at all. Two detained shots after fired at Super Bowl parade. Several victims struck. Two detained. Oh, it doesn't say anything about, uh, about what's going on. Yeah, yikes. So it looks like there was um, some shots. Hopefully it was just some guys being idiots and nothing, which they're being idiots either way. But several people were shot in Kansas City, Missouri on Wednesday. Reveals gathering to celebrate for the parade rally. Um, the shooting took place at West Union Station near the garage. Uh, the Chiefs fans were leaving, so it was after. Um, yikes. Two armed people have been detained. Gosh, people just being idiots. Um, so that's not going to be good for future parades. That's probably yeah. that's probably got ripple effects. Not to get we're not the best at like breaking down news live, but um, that is probably uh, – going to affect a lot of future parades yeah thoughts and prayers to obviously people affected but yeah the quick response too by uh you know kc police that's uh looks like they got on pretty quick so yeah. a million people though 600 police that numbers aren't super good so yeah people uh people are just stupid uh and people are just ignorant whether it's on social media whether it's at parades whether it is what it is it's a it's a interesting uh interesting world we live in yes. these days and yes. uh with technology and everything so um, yeah, no bueno. Hopefully yeah. everybody's okay and they got everything neutralized quickly and it doesn't affect too much stuff in the future. So that that is a bummer. Quick pivot. Um, no, so so thoughts and prayers with them for sure. Um, that's what you get here. You get live breaking news. You get you get sports takes. You get uh, be fluid. Be fluid. <laughs> be fluid. I like it. So what we got now is um, you know we're gonna try to keep positive and remain on a happy note. We're gonna get to the riddle me this section. This is where I riddle Lucas. Now I'm okay. gonna riddle you and make you look stupid. Deal. This is brought to you by which isn't hard to do. This segment is brought to you by Prime Corporate Services. They're our uh, tax and uh, kind of tax and legal partner for all of our community, both our, our tight knit actual like paid mentorship community as well as everybody listening um they do like a, a free 45 minute consult with you um let me tell you the catch here in a minute but they'll walk you through tax saving benefits um you know how to set a business credit they'll walk you through um you know different types of uh, llc formations you need and at the end of the call they say we can do it for you for extremely inexpensively which they do it for me personally or you can go do it by yourself the catch is so many of people in our community are successful that use their uh, their um, their services in the future because they lose money on yeah. those calls that we give. So if you're interested in set up an LLC for super inexpensive, just go to the show notes. If you listen to the podcast, if you're on YouTube, go down to the um, go down to the description below. There's a link in there, and if you're on Instagram or another platform, just DM me about an LLC, and I'll send you. It's a free. It's legitimately free for five minute consult. Yeah. We're not the subject matter experts in everything, so. <laughs> no, we are not. We don't pretend to be, which I like about us. Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, I'm nervous. So this is where I'm going to make you look stupid. All <laughs> right, this is the first riddle. This is the riddle. Here we go. I'm light as a feather, yet strong. Or, I'm light as a feather, yet the strongest person can't hold me for longer than a minute. What am I? 
Oh man, I'm light as a feather. I, yet the strongest person can't hold me for longer than a minute. This is gonna. This one's gonna be bad. I'm. I'm just gonna probably chalk up the L on this one. So light as a feather. So I'm gonna just assume like the weight doesn't exist in, okay. in my brain at least uh, on this one, and then bring it in like the strongest individual. Is it? Is it gravity? Is that a bad guess? That is not a bad guess. It's a breath. Okay. I okay. You were close, so that's that's like almost a half seat, but yeah, we we're gonna count an L. But that wasn't bad. You put that's some fine. thoughts in I'm that, but that makes sense. Some of them you hear the answer, you're like, Oh, that was stupid. But that's a good one. That's yeah. so you can hold the breath. I figured like I had a lot of like inspiration for gravity. I watched enough waste management Phoenix open coverage to see that gravity is undefeated. Yes, so gravity wins. Um a lot of big guys out there falling. Yeah, <laughs> and gravity wins and then um uh you know, friction, um if, if there's some um lubed up uh ground. The people are lubed up as far as drinking goes, and then yeah. that that mud man. People, people got so effed up at uh, at the, the waste management yeah. that was wild. Yeah, that's that a was lot of wild. lubrication. Your breath, David, got it. Nice, awesome. I like. Yeah, play David. along with us. This is fun. David. All right, here we go. That was fun. All, All right. right, that was close. All right, number two. What has a head? A tail is brown and has no legs. Okay, I, I I got a good pulse on this. You got one. this one. Um, I'm gonna go. I, I'm thinking of a, a 1980 penny. Ooh, he got it. A penny. I love it. No, it's not quite the copper, but it's it's seen some stuff. It's yeah. Oh long. yeah. It's been through it's it. Been through it's some been registers. in some pockets. It's yes. been in some pockets. Um, so yes, you got it right. There you go. One for two. I All like right. it. So this is this is the tiebreaker. This is the, the pivotal moment. Hey, Matthew focus lucas is going to hear about this okay, okay? he's probably I'm watching i'm ready all right i am taken from a mine and shut up in a wooden case from which i am never released and yet i am used by almost every single person what am i okay taken from a mine shut in a wooden case never released yet everybody uses me okay so mine i'm thinking resources so okay I'm thinking periodic table um Minerals comes to mind, um, so so I just have that in in the chamber in my brain. Okay, the and big then, empty thing up there. Yes, wooden case, um, um, uh, and using every day like that's that's um, that's the tricky part. Well, the using every day one gives me an idea, and I'm gonna I'm gonna run with it. So I'm thinking mineral, lead, lead coffin, pencil. Boom! He did it, everybody. A pencil, two, I nailed or three. It. I gotta come back. I get a a guest spot again to to just go through the. You riddle. gotta come back. That's not only the Kim Kardashian story. Oh. That's a Matthew story. Get it? That was that Chris Pratt said that joke. I like it. Uh, I like it. I like it. I like it. Very good. Um, awesome. So you were two for three. That's not too bad at all, Matthew. Now we get to go on to the true or false yes. segment. This is where I get to look smart. So this is Lucas always tells me that true or false is easier than the riddle but like the riddle they're trying to hint you towards the answer true or false uh, honestly it's usually they're trying to show you away from the answer like by trying to trick you yeah yeah it's I, like they give you like three key points and like you got to bring them together this That's one is like hey we're going to trick you and one little thing could be off yes all, all right. right all right so true or false sam the shortest war in history lasted only 38 minutes so see on this one your initial answer, like, this is where it could get tricky because it could be 15 minutes, and I could be wrong, right? So who knows? Obviously, I, I bet there's been very, very short wars where um, things have happened in the past. There's been a lot of wars in this world and um, a lot of stupid wars. Actually, pretty much all of them are, as uh, as well as the current ones. But um, the shortest war in history lasted 38 minutes. I'm going to say true. It is true. The Anglo-Zanzibar War That's of when I was thinking it was. <laughs> lasted for just 38 minutes, making it the shortest war recorded in history. That's like uh, a Friends episode and a half, or that's like five blueies. Yeah. I, I just want to know when they started the clock. Like, yeah. <laughs> How did they? Well, maybe it was like, maybe like the war decree starts at midnight, or like that at midnight, and then they like met and figured it all out. How but. many people do you need to like declare uh, an official war? I don't know. Is, a fight. is there a document? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know what it is. If it was two people, that's that's tough. Huh? Yeah, I think you need. I think there needs to be some type of nation nation behind it. Yeah. I would guess, or some type of attempt Sup to take over a nation. Supporting group. Okay. All right. I love these animals. All right, penguins. True or false? Penguins are capable of flying. 
See, the obvious answer is I'm not giving you an answer yet. The obvious answer is false. Um, or you could look at it as are they capable but just don't because they don't need to. But, man, there there's a lot of fat on penguins, even the little ones. I'm sure their body fat's pretty high, obviously, considering they're in, um, you know, low-temperature areas and they need that blubber. So, see, this could be trying to trick me. I'm going to go with my gut. I'm going to say false. It is false. And I was, like, they got those baby flaps. I've seen them. You know, strut the wings a it little bit. It doesn't count when they go down like a, a, a slope and shoot up in the air. I don't yeah. think that, that's just, that's just seen, falling. Have you seen them jump onto like icebergs and like <laughs> the hops that mm-hmm. get out of the water? Yeah. They're not really hops. It's just like a swim leap. But have you, there's a, there's an offensive or defensive um, football player that jumped yes. out of the pool. Was that Penny Sewell? Is that yeah. it? Yeah. Like a 350 pound dude. Yeah. Just, and I think it wasn't like reversed. I think it was legitimate. Yeah. Which I can't. I can't jump on this table, let alone jump out of a pool. Sometimes I can't even get out with the stairs. I like can jump. On, actually, I can jump on this table. Yeah, don't do it today. You don't think so? <laughs> no. Okay. Leave All right, Lucas. All right, last but not two least. Two for two. You are two for two. The shortest war in American history lasted one day. That seems like broad, like legitimately 24 hours. We went from 38 seconds to like one day. It seems too broad for me. Um the wars I know of, that there must be one war I don't know about. I'm sure there are several I don't know about, but they all definitely didn't last a day. So I'm going to say I'm going to say false on this one, just because I'm playing See, with house money. It's true, and I would I w- I'm going to tell you why I thought false. But the Toledo War between Ohio and Michigan in 1835 lasted only a day. Okay, here would, here would be my thought process. I have no idea about this war, but like think about the time to like reload you know, a gun or like just packing gunpowder. Back in like, the day. Yeah. I feel like it's just like, like wars are just naturally extended, mm-hmm. but it's yeah, crazy. We had we a big war theme today. Yeah. 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 Well, that was fun. I'm you did a great it. job, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're a great guest. You may have earned, you may have earned a different one when Lucas is out gallivanting across the world or partying all night, then the, you can be the, 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 the sub in. Perfect. He did a great job. Well, awesome. Well, any any parting words you want to leave the people with? Oh, yeah, just going back to Dennis. Dennis said it. Um, yeah, if you're thinking about taking action, just do it. Um, there's so much opportunity in real estate. It all starts with connection. So uh, what I want you guys to do, um, if you're not doing it already, is go find those local meetups. Go start connecting with people in your community. Uh, it's amazing what, you know, one plus one doesn't equal two. It equals, you know, 100. So uh, just make those connections. Uh, believe in yourself and, and just start taking action. So I like it. Yeah, we got our local meetup here in St. Louis tomorrow. So if you're watching live, uh, Thursday, the 15th of um, uh, Val- it's Valentine's Day. We didn't yeah, even say Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. Um, the 15th of February, Luke and I are actually presenting on the other side of this wall um, about all our biggest mistakes. So if you're in the St. Louis area, come on out to uh, Buyers Club. Uh, look it up. It's going to be a banger of a meeting. And I would agree. I think just take action. Like I was thinking about this probably going to talk about a little bit tomorrow the presentation but like you just got to action your way to results like Luke's and I didn't know what we were doing at first we just went to meetups that's taking action yeah. we went to Southside went to buyers club we went to all the meetups we could we bought a house didn't even know about refinance method we didn't even know about the birds method we just we just you figure it out when you actually do it. you can only learn 20% of it by sitting on the sidelines 80% of it you you learn by actually doing it yeah. even with the best coaching you just have to do it yeah i think regardless it's going to be scary like i feel like if you don't have butterflies like you should probably get that checked out because like something that can literally change your life is going to have like invoke emotion in you and having just like over analyzing that analysis paralysis like that impacts so many people that have so many opportunities to to change the trajectory of what their freedom journey looks like so just uh get out there and do it whatever that looks like for you it's not buying a house tomorrow but Make a connection with people in your community. Like, that's the most important part. Just do it, Nike. All right, let's, we're going to throw the paper in the trash can All now. Right. We've decided that Matthew's shot counts for Lucas. Beautiful. All right, you nervous? Never nervous. You want me to go first? You want to go first? Uh, so, Chiefs, I'll, I'll go second. Chiefs oh, like the Super Bowl? Yeah. All right, here we go. Like the Super Got Bowl. it good? We good? Uh. Two, 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 two. Walls suck on it. Thanks for listening to today's episode. 
We hope you got some major value from our conversation. If you love what you learn, make sure you like, rate, review the show, and help us spread the word by telling a friend. If you'd like to learn more about working with me inside one of my programs, we'll have those links in the show notes along with all our social media handles so you connect with us there for free. If there's a real estate question you'd like us to answer, feel free to send us a message and we'll cover it in an upcoming show.